hello, welcome and welcome back to my channel. My name is Jess, this is Nigel, and welcome to another episode of Book Community, where I try to keep you abreast of the goings on in the bookish community. Also, look at my shirt, look at my shirt. <laughs> I work hard so my dog can have a better life. Love that. That's why I'm here hustling for y'all. It's really for Nigel. So I took last week off, well, the book community did not because as we know, the devil works hard, but book Twitter works harder. Thank you, Steph, for that infamous quote. So I obviously am not gonna be able to cover everything. I'm gonna cover some things and it's just a never ending, <laughs> a never ending story. There's always things happening. I can't get to everything, but I'll try my best. If you emailed me or DM'd me, I'm behind. I'm sorry, I'll try to get to them as soon as possible. But before we get into the tea, I would like to thank Surfshark for sponsoring today's video. What is Surfshark VPN, you ask, as a virtual private network? It's one that I've used for the two years I've lived abroad, and it has many benefits. I'll go over the quote unquote important benefits first, like you can protect your privacy online, so it protects you when you're browsing, if you're out in public and you're using public Wi-Fi, can block ads and malware, keep your searches private because you know, you know, mm-hmm. Some of these searches be a little really interesting. Also can protect your, your data, um, so protect your identity and your email accounts. You can even sign up to get notifications if someone hacks your email accounts. And it allows you to access content um, safely. And one of the main reasons that I got a VPN was being abroad, I couldn't watch programs that were on in America or use Hulu. So a VPN definitely helps you with that. And there's some other benefits with Surfshark. You can have one account, use it on unlimited devices devices that means you can have it on multiple phones ipads tvs anywhere that it works you can use multiple accounts literally i think they have the best price and there's a deal if you use my code and it's really easy to use so like i said i have used surfshark for the two years that i've lived abroad and it's really easy i have it downloaded on my computer as well as on multiple other things and there's all these different locations that you can choose if you're trying to watch specific content i often use united states so that i can watch us netflix use you know hbo max hulu but you can also do different countries over the world and uh log into some other netflix you know they took Doctor Who off of Amazon Prime, so maybe you need to go to UK Netflix so you can watch Doctor Who. This is very important. So it's a great price already, but if you use my code, you can save even more money. My code is Owens, just my last name, O-W-E-N-S, and you can get 83% off and then three extra months for free. That's wild. The plans are already super cheap, especially the longer you do them, it's gonna be cheaper per month. So if you just did one month, it's $12.95 a month, but you're getting 83% off of that. I can't do math, but that's hella cheap. And then the longer you do it, obviously it's gonna be super cheap. Here are the prices in Euro, also in the British pound. So I'm just saying, the prices are already super affordable. Then you can use my code, get 83% off. I don't know what you're doing. I'll have the link down below in the description, but again, my code is Owens, O-W-E-N-S for 83% off and three extra months for free. So thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring today's video. Now to the tea. Okay, I got my hair retwisted and it's really giving me a uh, crisscross from the 90s, but it is what it is. I don't, you know, I don't know what to do, y'all. It, it's stiff but it's fresh, you know what I'm saying? So with the tea. So we're gonna start out with Casey McQuiston, who is the author of popular book, Red, White, and Royal Blue. Oh my gosh, y'all were so obnoxious <laughs> with this book when it came out a couple years ago. I feel like still people talk about this book, obsess over this book. It is a male male romance. And I finally was like, all right, y'all won't shut up. I'm gonna read the book. I thought it was boring. So I DNF'd it in, I don't know, 25%. So haven't read the whole thing, but it's overall really loved in the book community. And so recently someone pointed out a line in the book um, that they found offensive. So the line is, well, my UN ambassador fucked up his one job and said something idiotic about Israel. And now I have to call Netanyahu and personally apologize. But the good thing is it's two in the morning in Tel Aviv. So I can put it off until tomorrow and have dinner with you two instead. Some people were confused why this was harmful. And so somebody 
explained. The problem with that quote is that it marginalizes the ethnic cleansing of an entire population by making it into a joke like that. Basically, ugh, my ambassador showed support for oppressed people and now I have to apologize to the head of the oppressive, oppressive settler colonial save face. And there is a tweet that was deleted, but they replied it may not have said that, but it was definitely implied by the way she grumbled about having to call Netanyahu to apologize for what her ambassador said. She means the ambassador said something against Israel, which means that her apologizing for that comment makes her a Zionist. Well, there are people who are upset that was in the book or pointed out. Like I said, this book has been out for a few years, but this just recently was pointed out. So of course, there were people who were upset about this being presented, whether they had read the book and not noticed it or if they hadn't read it at all. And some people were like, are you serious? Y'all are calling out an author for a lie in a book made by a fictional character. And there was even an article written by someone named Laura Miller. But anyway, this something happened similarly with Ellen Hildebrand, who has been mentioned on this channel before for acting a fool. And so the article is bogus social media outrage is making authors change lines in their books now. The silly idea that a fictional character's statements reflect an author's actual beliefs is spreading. And Ellen Hildebrand's latest novel, I believe that's out this summer, if it's not already out, there is two teens, Vivi and Savannah, discuss plans for Vivi to hide out in the attic of Savannah's house with Savannah's parents, without Savannah's parents' knowledge. And a quote from the book is, you're suggesting I hide here all summer? Vivi asked, like, like Anne Frank. The two friends laugh at this, but Vivi thinks to herself, is it really funny? And is Vivi so off base? People call her out on Instagram saying this joke is anti-Semitic and it's not funny and, you know, demanding an apology. So Hildebrand apparently issued a formal apology and stated that the line would be removed from the book. I think this was someone reading an advanced reader copy, so I don't think it was out at the time. And so with Red, White and Royal Blue, Casey McQuiston tweeted, so like a, a bot account or just like, I don't know what you call it, but it's like a bot account for Red, White and Royal Blue. And they said, hello, as admin of this account, I just want to clear the air and say that I am pro-Palestine. That being said, I don't know why Casey decided to include that line in the book. And I understand why it made so many people uncomfortable. Casey McQuiston, please explain. And so Casey replied and said, I wrote this line as a dig at US presidential diplomacy. It was an attempt to punch up at liberal American politics, not a statement of my beliefs. I could and should have made that clearer. It has been changed for all future printings. So some people were like, oh, that's not an apology. And other people felt that Casey shouldn't have had to apologize because people shouldn't take what fictional characters say as a direct reflection of the author. And I mean, that's a conversation that's old as time, I swear, in the book community. But uh, some people said, a tweet I have is, folks are killing me with an author doesn't have to agree with what a character says takes because yeah, no shit. But if the author doesn't do anything to interrogate those harmful politics in the book or in real life, um, guess what? It's sus and readers have a right to call it. So then of course there are people who are agreeing with that. Like if you don't interrogate, you can put harmful content in your book. May it be that line about Israel and Palestine or when there's like misogyny in your books. But if it's just there and it seems like I don't know how to explain it. I'm not a writer, but sometimes those things can be present in books, but the author takes time to challenge it, um, to make it known that they're that it's something that does exist, but that they don't agree with it. But then there's some that just put that in a book. Just you're like, none of the characters challenge it. No one ever grows from it. They just continue with that harmful behavior. And I think that's the problem. Again, I haven't read Red, White and Royal Blue, but that line mm, as a way to like punch at politics, like, I guess then it's never, I don't know if it's just like a one liner and they never address it again, but it's not gonna be in any future printings of the book. I mean, it is what it is now, I guess, but it's a little too little too late. And someone also mentioned something about the importance of like editors who don't realize these things har are harmful before things go to print, but. <sighs> Okay, I wanted to add these tweets in and it's from uh, Brandon, an author. And Brandon said, last night I saw a fan bot account for an author call the author out over a line of dialogue in the novel and demand accountability from them on this website and knew that we'd jump the shark. Truly, reality is glitching. At a certain point, it's not even funny anymore, just weird. The fan bot account literally tagged the author and said, please explain. Remember when I said that readers are actually super judgmental and moralistic and people got mad at me and said they weren't? Oh, 
what do y'all think do you think it's like too much to what happens like explain this line or do you think it was reasonable and an author should be expected to address lines like this in their books tell me then on the topic of Casey McQuiston this is less about Casey McQuiston and more about people who are reading the book woof 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 there was a not cute take someone on book talk so it was shared and it was a video of a person who loved red white and royal blue which I said is a male male romance and so Casey McQuiston has a new book out that is a lesbian romance and it's called one last stop so this person loved red white and royal blue now they're reading one last stop and they posted this. I never thought I would be making. I am DNFing one last stop temporarily. Let me explain. Okay, so I, like everyone else on Book Talk, loved this book so much. So automatically, I thought I would like this book. I was sadly mistaken. Um, I think the biggest reason why I'm not a fan of one last stop it's because they're lesbians. I loved how cute and sweet and quirky Red, White, and Royal Blue was. And yes, they were gay. I didn't mind that, but I was attracted to them. I'm not, I'm not getting it. Also, quite honestly, um, Red, White, and Royal Blue was more along the lines of it was exciting because it wasn't your regular, like, story. Because it was the first print, the first son in the Prince of Wales, right? So it's not a regular person's life. But unfortunately, this, you're, you're following August during her day-to-day -day life. And honestly, it's boring. I'm bored. I mean, yeah, I got to the spicy scene, but I... I'm trying to realize what you guys are talking about when this when you said that red, white, and royal blue was stayed to black because there's there's really not much spice. I hadn't really noticed that before, and I've also branched out a little bit since then. Love how the creator just deleted the video and blocked me when I said something. So basically, like I find the men attractive, so I can be about this male male romance, but the women. Mm -mm. So then people were like talking about the fetishization a lot of women do with male male romance and woof. There was a follow up video. My opinion on the book still stands. It was boring. I, in my opinion, the characters were unrelatable. The lifestyle was unrelatable and there was really- The lifestyle? I know you did not just refer to me and a lesbian as a lifestyle. What are you doing? The lifestyle was unrelatable. Okay. So sorry. I am on my phone now. So sorry if there is a quality visually and audially. Audio? Audio? <laughs> so sorry if there's a change in visual and audio quality. My camera died. And I thought that I was getting batteries from Amazon, but then I was like, can't deliver to your location. Um, and so the only ones that I found here are the very expensive actual Sony battery, which is like 50 euro for one battery. So I guess I'm just gonna have to buy that and be, instead of being able to get three not Sony batteries and a recharging block for like $20, I get one for $50. And I don't even know if it comes with a charging block, but it's just the woes of living overseas and some of the most simple things you think could ship, won't ship, and then some things do ship. I, I am on my phone and we shall continue. So I don't know where I was, but some of the replies to this video that at least were on Twitter were, you know, that how it's strange and some people said how sad that to enjoy a book, she has to feel sexually attracted to the characters, which is sad, like, do you always have to be sexually attracted to the characters? But the big, the big conversation was the over fetishization. I can never say this word. The fetishization, fetishization, the fetishization 
of male male romance which is very common and someone made a good point if i can find the tweet i'll add it here about that she may have said this she may be the only one that we've seen has said this but she said the quiet part loud because this is true for many people and it's a reason that male male romance tend to do so well and lesbian or female female romances don't do as well or aren't as popular as male male romances so i think that she made an apology video if i find it i'll insert it here a lot of really good educational civil conversations i actually i finally understood things from your guys's perspective and i do realize that what i did was incredibly wrong and i am extremely sorry um i know that's really kind of too little too late and i know it's not really enough but I would actually really like to continue the discussion and try to become more understanding and compassionate with one another. And um, this is not me excusing what I said in any way whatsoever. But I grew up very sheltered. I only learned that the LGBTQ plus community existed in high school. So I am still learning a whole lot and I didn't realize that by saying what I said that that would be considered like offensive. So I am deeply sorry to everyone. Um, please accept this apology and let me know what I can do to help us move forward. I also saw someone share this on Twitter and it says, if you were never going to be near the ghetto, why read a book about it? I read to escape this world, not to read about this world. If you have no family or friends who are queer, why read about it to gain an understanding? There are no classes to take on how not to offend a gay person. Feel free to vent in the comments. So, I mean, at first she said she was sticking to her opinion and obviously posted this, but then said after discussing with people that she understands where she went wrong. So, I mean, I don't know. I hope, I hope she learned something from it. You know, at least she apologized, I guess. Every time I think about joining TikTok, I feel like one of these videos is shared and I'm like, never mind, it ain't for me. My bra. If you see my bra strap, mind your business. I'm wearing a bra, so be happy. So it's been a while since I've been on Twitter and been completely lost on what was going on, but this did happen uh, this past week and we did a live show talking about it on Bethany's channel. So it was myself, Bethany, Mara, and Ashley. And so I'll link that live stream if you wanna watch the replay, but it was about content and trigger warnings in books and talking about the app Storygraph or app and website. I don't know if they have an app, but it is a website, an alternative to Goodreads. So on Storygraph, it has different features than Goodreads. Some things Goodreads has that Storygraph doesn't have. Like I don't think Storygraph has a social um, aspect to it, but on Storygraph, there's like more ways to categorize your book. So you can add tags to it, like talk about the pacing, if it was fast, slow, whatever, talk about the content, if it's mild, medium, and also you can add like trigger warnings and they have a whole range of things that you can add and you can also put mild, medium, severe, I think for the severity you think the, how much it's represented in the book. And so I know a lot of people really love Storygraph and for that, for a reason, because they want a way, a better way to find trigger warnings for books that they want to read. But then I was seeing tweets that were saying, falsely tagging books with trigger warnings of things that don't occur and mislabeling cultural practices is deeply harmful to authors, especially by POC ones who are already facing more obstacles to success in publishing. Nuance and accuracy and context are necessary when using trigger warnings. This isn't to say trigger warnings are inherently negative, and I think that's obvious. The authors who are being affected by incorrect trigger warnings are supportive of trigger warnings. The problem is false ones, culturally sensitive ones, and ones that lack any context whatsoever. Another tweet I saw was, I'm so tired of bi POC and it's specifically women and or femmes of color speaking about valid things unapologetically and with clarity and immediately being called aggressive and seen as attacking people. I've already seen myself and other bi POC authors painted as attacking story graph and its users simply for pointing out how people have inaccurately used trigger warnings. This is all kinds of fucked up and it's racist. And then the last one I saw, 
Um, and it's when Bethany messaged me about the live stream and I was like, oh my gosh, what is going on? Was well, good morning. It was from Kaylin Barron, the author of Cinderella is Dead. And she said, good morning, y'all got me fucked up. So let me be clear. Storygraph is not the problem here. I've worked with them and I adore them. The abuse of their the abuse of their content warning system by racists and homophobes is my only issue. Content warnings are valuable and that's why I keep a running list of them on my website. Storygraph is trying to provide an alternative to Goodreads. I am frustrated that once again, a space that is trying to be better can't exist without racism and homophobia creeping in. We can never escape it. Forgive me if I'm a little frustrated. So then, you know, digging, 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 and then I found some quote tweets and I think this started with a conversation from Silvio Moreno Garcia. So when I found Silvio Moreno Garcia's tweets, which there are multiple threads and I won't be able to read all of them and I'm, they're kind of confusing because she quote tweets her own threads and so it's, it's a lot. But anyway, one of the things that she quote tweeted was a thread by another person and their profile says Nick. So I wanted to share Nick's thread because I think they say some interesting things and then I'll share one of Sylvia's thread and then some conversation around that kind of hit on the high points that we talked about in the live stream and then, you know, see what y'all have to say. But Nick said, pretty odd to see a lot of people telling a small press publisher about the importance of content warnings when the overwhelming majority of publishing doesn't put content warnings on their books. And I guarantee that despite concerns about trauma, warnings will harm books. Leaving aside the sheer fact that warnings are a psychotherapeutic tool and copywriters, editors, authors are generally speaking entirely untrained in psychology, such warnings will only become a marketing tool just as film and music and video game ratings are. You'll have explicitness and traumatizing content highlighted as a marketing tool for people who want an extreme experience, expurgated editions next to complete editions, quick, buy one for someone else as a gift, did you get the right one? And substantial market confusion. How confused can the market be? Let me introduce you to the monthly meta thread here on Twitter, where dozens of people explain that only on the young adult shelves can someone find queer characters, or writing that isn't pornography by men, the bad gender that writes bad books. The warnings one sees on music and films, etc. all industry attempts to keep the state from outright censoring material and criminalizing creation. Books have managed, thanks to social cachet and high profile court cases to avoid this fate so far. And these ratings haven't made for more pleasant listening, viewing, playing experience. The specific weight of likely traumatizing material has increased, not decreased. It's rated M, right? Have a cartoon character choke on a turd and die? It's not like the toys and t-shirts are rated, am I right? Oh, accountant of mine. So rating systems in general are half scam. Why does nearly every feature film have one guy shouting fuck for no reason? In a book, of course, the author or editor can write an introduction or preface that would do more than more or preface that would do more than merely warn suicide, violence, etc., and could give an intellectual and aesthetic context for the work. That's the best and smartest way to deal with truly rough material. This also leaves aside the utter ubiquity and bizarre extensions of content warnings elsewhere. I saw one on Facebook recently that read content warning work. And this week we saw demands for changes content changes was absolutely the next step. So having a character mention Israel in a two year old book is bad enough that it'll be edited out. Of course, the zillion books mentioned discuss are about Israel, but that just proves the point. So we likely see changes in both directions, extreme material made more extreme to thrill the reader with a laundry list of warnings and toothless material becoming because commuting is traumatic for some people. Note, a friend of mine was experiencing dozens of suicidal ideations a week. Most of them vanished when his job changed and his rush hour commute vanished. It didn't go that far for me, but my mental health greatly improved when I wasn't greeted with a train to jump in front of twice a day. Even though warnings aren't censorship, supporters simply assume that they'll be implemented exactly as supporters wish them to be. Instead, being used to attack sex content, but not ultra violence, as in films, won't be used primarily against POC creators, as in music, etc. There are very few record stores or video stores, but plenty of bookstores left. And it would be simplicity itself for someone who likes to see their name in the news fill two baskets of books with content warning titles and demand to know what is being done about this. Books are already under constant attack. Content warnings does the shopping for the would-be tyrant so that the evil book display at the earnest press conference can be put together on a moment's notice. As someone reminded me, good luck getting oh, Octavia Butler on a school reading list under a content warning regime fiend. I know that was long, but I thought they made some really interesting points about how if something that was like a mainstream, uh, if, if there was an organization that was tasked with putting content warnings and trigger warnings on books, which is kind of a, a discussion that has gone on before, that it 
just it wouldn't work um, I don't think they explicitly said it in this thread but also everything that is a warning for for one person isn't a warning for someone else and vice versa like you can't think of everything that might harm someone or that they might want to know in advance is in a book and then also I do agree that it could go the one way where they're like all of this traumatic stuff like I don't know if y'all remember this was months ago I covered a book on here that was full of uh, triggering content and people asked for trigger warnings and the author wrote this whole like introduction into the book saying this book is full of triggers like everything you could think of but I'm not gonna list trigger warnings and people read it and gave and it was like a laundry list of things that were inside of the book so I think people would go that way and then other people and it depends on who is the person creating the warnings because it could go the other way and just put warnings on it for stuff that really even doesn't matter and it could just be a way to get more books banned or challenged by parents or groups if people make aware certain things that are in the book not to say that it's bad it's kind of it's it's a lot and it it's a lot and that's how we talked about in the in the live stream and Ashley as a librarian was saying that something like this if there was a medium that was control or that was in charge of putting content warnings on things that she wasn't really a fan of it because of how easier that would make it for like groups and parents and churches and whatever to try to ban and challenge books and they already do that without um, content warnings on it. So the main thread I saw from Sylvia that quote tweeted this thread. Other thing is these can be wildly inaccurate. I had someone content warn one of my works for poverty. Another one for animal death, the dog lives. The story graph lists Mexican Gothic for cannibalism as explicit, moderate and mild. Which one is it, a little bite or a buffet? <laughs> What I've seen happen mostly with warnings is that when it's something people like, they'll read it anyway, like a superhero show, etc. But when it's some author of color or minority writer, it's immediately becomes, it immediately becomes an impassable herder. So Beloved can't read it because incest, but Game of Thrones gonna watch all seasons. It's especially easy, it's an especially easy tool to wield for censors who hate things like GLBT authors or POC. They can hide their hatred under a fig leaf. And like Nick says, for content that is truly volatile, there's the well-written intro. For The Route of Ice and Salt, we had three pieces, an intro by me, the forward by the author, and afterward by Billy Martin, who wrote his Poppy Z. Bright, because it's, it's an explicitly erotic novella about Dracula's voyage written by a Mexican author who was originally published in the 1990s and it needed all the context it could get so people wouldn't complain the gays were being erotic. But of course, not every book is like this and not every little characteristic needs to be tagged. Plus, in the end, this is why we supposedly need reviewers and critics, not just to take pictures of books, but to analyze and place them in their context. Is that function gone? Too many books and movies are being consumed as lines or snapshots. This provides for easy, quick digestion, but it's like judging a meal by the garnish. Described in terms of tropes, both Beloved and Get Out become racist, violent products that ought to be shunned. I've seen many reviews of The Route of Ice and Salt where the reviewers say they had to pause and think about the novella, but they couldn't make easy decisions about how to talk about it right after reading. It's not wrong, I think, to sit in silence and thought, but our desire to immediately share our take and to do it in a few characters and maybe a picture overwhelms us. We want the world to know, but contemplation is valuable as our conversations that extend beyond the immediate moment. And then Sylvia adds in two other threads talking about this and some reviewers were saying that she was against readers because of the comment she made about reviewers doing more than just taking pictures of books or like that's not what she was saying she was saying that it's complicated there needs to be context and it's not a black and white situation it's not no content warnings no trigger warnings or yes content warnings trigger warnings for everything as with most things it needs nuance and so in some cases where it might be a really erotic intense book maybe something written by the author in the beginning is better maybe if there's one thing a content warning is better for that book if it's just like content warning sexual assault it just isn't straight up one way for all books and that's what she was saying and talking about how inaccurate they can be because i think I don't know if she meant Mexican Gothic or if it was another tweet I saw, but someone was saying the book had cannibalism tagged as a content warning because they were doing communion. Because technically it's no you eat of the flesh and the blood of Jesus. And so they're not always accurate. And then a lot of times 
marginalized writers are targeted by people trying to get less people to read their book by tagging things that aren't even in it. So there were examples that Sylvia showed screenshots of. She already mentioned the difference between Beloved and Game of Thrones, but then she had screenshots from Storygraph with Fifty Shades of Grey, which is uh, intent, intense, highly erotic novel, lots of kinky things going on, which is fine. For content warnings, there's one, and it's tagged by two people. It says sexual content. And for Kindred by Octavia Butler, it's a laundry list of tags, and they vary from minor to graphic with all of the things that are and i i haven't read kindred so i can't speak on that and i've read 50 shades of gray and think there should be more content warnings then there also was gone with the wind which i haven't read but i know that there's racism in it and it does have content warnings but then if you go over to their eyes are watching god by zora neale hurston a black author which i have read it's twice as many and so it's being also so while the ideal is uh, positive and that it helps a lot of people, it's also being used by some people as a weapon to attack marginalized creators and try to prevent people from reading their book by saying, oh no, this book is bad. It has all of these negative things in it. So it's just not a, like I said, black or white situation. There's a lot of nuance in it. And um, I would watch the live show because we shared a lot of our perspectives in there. I have tried to start including maybe some content warnings in my written reviews I do on Goodreads and sometimes in my video if it has like things that, that stand out to me that might be, you know, harmful to someone. But again, everything from my lived experience that I think may negatively affect someone isn't going to cover everything. And then somebody who's had maybe a more traumatic experience is going to flag more things than I would because of their experience. So there's like, I don't think there's ever going to be a perfect way to handle content warnings and trigger warnings. And a great perspective I think that uh, was brought up in the live, I forgot by who, was to, if you are into reading or watching reviews, that you find people that you, um, you can learn their style of reviewing and what they're gonna call out and how accurate that's gonna be. So if you watch a person and they're telling you content warning for sexual assault and you know or domestic violence and then you read the book and it's really not as heavy as maybe they mention, then maybe you can kind of uh, judge by that. Or if you follow someone and, and they tell you warnings for books and they're pretty spot on, then maybe you know that you can trust that person to give you warnings for books. So there's no perfect way you're gonna have to kind of use reviewers, also maybe read multiple reviews. So if people are saying there's these warnings are in, so maybe if people are saying these themes are in the book, one person saying it's like extremely there, it's, it's severe, it's graphic, and someone's just saying, ah, it's just kind of there. If you read maybe multiple reviews, you can kind of get an idea. But at the end of the day, it's gonna be really hard to just have a one way, a, a one system that's gonna work for everybody. That's my opinion. So in recent news, in an update with, I guess you can call it a feud between Nigerian authors Akweke Amezi and, and Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. I think I'm saying that correctly. So I haven't read from either author. I know both have really well loved works, especially Adichie. I had books from her that were like on my TBR. I don't own them, but that I wanted to read eventually. But I don't know if this only surfaced last year or came to my knowledge because she made a statement that J.K. Rowling's essay was, um, she said something about it being perfectly reasonable. And as we know, J.K. Rowling is a well-established transphobe. And so then people were like, oh my God, Adichie is a turf as well because she's agreeing with Joanne's comments. And so Akweke Amezi is non-binary and they were a student essentially of Adichie because um, a Chimamanda does a like writing workshop in Nigeria with about 20 writers I think maybe each year and Akweke was one of those students and uh, Chimamanda mentored them and so now Akweke uh, Amezi is a published author and is doing well and so I think they both are feeling betrayed by the other one, Akweke, because they are non-binary and Adichie supporting anti 
trans rhetoric and you know the hate that JK Rowling is spewing and then uh Chimamanda because uh she feels I guess betrayed by a student or someone she put a lot of time and effort into to help them build their craft so like I said, Chimamanda said that one of J.K. Rowling's recent essays was perfectly reasonable. And I think there were tweets and things that were going about around that time last year, somewhere towards the end of the year. And so now recently, Chimamanda has published an essay herself where she doesn't name anybody, but then there are comments on social media that makes it kind of clear that it is a Kweke Amezi, at least one of the people that Chimamanda is referring to. So I hope that made sense. So I'm going to read Chimamanda's essay. So this was published on June 15th, 2021. It is obscene, a true reflection in three parts. Part one, when you are a public figure, people will write and say false things about you. It comes with the territory. Many of those things you brush aside, many you ignore. The people close to you advise you that silence is best, and it often is. Sometimes though, silence makes a lie begin to take on the shimmer of truth. In, the age, in this age of social media, where a story travels the world in minutes, silence sometimes means that other people can hijack your story and soon their false version becomes the defining story about you. Falsehood flies and the truth comes limping after it as Jonathan Swift wrote. Take the case of a young woman who attended my Lagos writing workshop some years ago. She, should, she stood out because she was bright and interested in feminism. After the workshop, I welcomed her into my life. I very rarely do this because my past experiences with young Nigerians left me wary of people who are calculating and insincere and want to use me only as an opportunity. But she was a bright young Nigerian feminist and I thought that was worth making an exception. She spent time in my Lagos home. We had long conversations. I was support giver, counselor, comforter. Then I gave an interview in March 2017 in which I said that a trans woman is a trans woman. The larger point of which was to say that we should be able to acknowledge difference while being fully inclusive. That in fact, the whole premise of inclusiveness is difference. I was told she went on social media and insulted me. This woman knows me enough to know that I fully support the rights of trans people and all marginalized people, that I have always been fiercely supportive of difference in general, and that I am a person who reads and thinks and forms my opinion in a careful, carefully considered way. Of course, she could very well have had concerns with the interview, that is fair enough, but I had a personal relationship with her. She could have emailed or called or texted me. Instead, she went on social media to put on a public performance. I was stunned. I couldn't believe it, but I mostly held myself responsible. My spirit had been slightly stalled from the beginning by her. My first sense of unease with her came when she posted a photo taken in my house at a time when I did not want any photos of my personal life on social media. I asked that she take it down. The second case of unease was her publicizing something I was t I had told her in confidence about another member of the workshop. The most upsetting was when she, without telling me, used my name to apply for an American visa. Above all else was my lingering suspicion that she was a person who chose as friends only those from whom she could benefit. But she was a bright young Nigerian feminist and I allowed that sentiment to override my unease. After she publicly insulted me, it was clear to me that this kind of noxious person had no business in my life ever again. A few months later, she sent this affected self-regarding email which I ignored. About a year later, she sent this email which I also ignored. I hoped never to hear from her again, but she has recently gone on social media to write about how she refused to kiss my ring. As if I demanded some kind of obeisance from her? Wow, I can't read. She also suggests that there is some dark shadowy more to tell that she won't tell with an undertone of if only you knew the whole story. It is a manipulative way of lying. By suggesting there is more when you very well when you know very well that there isn't, you do sufficient reputational damage while also being able to plead deniability. Innuendo without fact is immoral. No, there isn't more to the story. It is a simple story. You got close to a famous person. You publicly insulted the famous person to aggrandize yourself. The famous person cut you off. You sent emails and texts that were ignored. And then you decided to go on social media to peddle falsehoods. It is obscene to tell the world that you refuse to kiss a ring when in fact there isn't any ring at all. I cannot make much of the hostility of strangers who do not know me. Fame taints our view of the humanity of famous people, but the truth is a famous person remains irretrievably human. Fame does not inoculate the famous person from 
Fame does not inoculate the famous person from disappointment and depression. Fame does not make you any less angered or hurt by the dupli duplicitous nature of people. To be famous is to be assumed to have power, which is true, but in the analysis of fame, people often ignore the vulnerability that comes with fame and they are unable to see how others who have nothing to lose can lie and connive in order to take advantage of that fame, while not giving a single thought to the feelings and humanity of the famous person. And when you personally know a famous person, when you have experienced their humanity, when you have benefited from their kindness and yet you are unable to extend to them the basic grace and respect that even a casual acquaintanceship deserves, then it says something fundamental about you. And in a deluded way, you will convince yourself that your hypocritical, self-regarding, compassion-free behavior is in fact principled feminism. It isn't. You will wrap your mediocre malice in the false godliness of ideological purity but it's still malice. You will tell yourself that being able to parrot the latest American feminist orthodoxy justifies your hacking at the spirit of a person who has shown you only kindness. You can call your opportunism by any name, but it doesn't make it any less of the ugly opportunism that it is. So there's part two. When I first read this person's work, which was their application to my writing workshop, I thought the sentences were well done. I accepted this person. At the workshop, I thought they could have been more respectful of the other participants, perhaps not kept perhaps not kept typing dismissively as other stories were discussed with an air of being among people below their level. After the workshop, I decided to select the best stories, edit them, pay their writers a fee, and publish them in an e-magazine. The first story I chose was this person's. I wrote a glowing introduction, which the story truly deserved. They sent this email. About a year later, they sent another email to let me know that their novel would be published. Before the novel was published, I spoke of it to some people to help it get attention. I had not been able to finish reading it. I found the writing beautiful, but the story false-hearted and burdened by bathos. When I spoke of the novel, however, it was the former sentiment that I expressed never the latter. After I gave the March 2017 interview in which I said that a trans woman is a trans woman, I was told that this person had insulted me on social media, calling me, among other things, a murderer. I was deeply upset because while I did not really know them personally, I felt they knew what I stood for and that I fully supported the rights of trans people and that I do not wish anybody dead. Still, I took no action. I ignored the public insult. When this person's publisher sent me an early copy of their novel, I was surprised to see that my name was included in their cover biography. I had never seen that done in a book before. I didn't like that I had not been asked for permission to use my name. But most of all, I thought, why would a person who thinks I'm a murderer want my name so prominently displayed in their biography? Then I learned that because my name was in the cover biography, a journalist had called them my protege, and then they threw a Twitter tantrum about it, calling it clickbait, viciously disavowing having received any help from me. I knew this person had called me a murderer. I knew they were actively campaigning to cancel me and tweeting about how I should no longer be invited to speak at events, but this felt I could not ignore. So they sent an email. Um, their representative contacted the publisher and uh, let's see on the subject of how to go about it I was absolutely determined not to be used by this person but I was also sensitive to the cost the publisher might incur as this was not in any way the publisher's fault instead of pulping the already printed copies I asked that the jackets be stripped and rebound to my representative I wrote I was assured that my name would be removed and I moved on, but from time to time I would be informed of yet another social media post of which this person had attacked me. This person has created a space in which social media followers have, and I find this unforgivable, trivialized my parents' death, claiming that the sudden and devastating loss of my parents within months of each other during this pandemic was punishment for my transphobia. This person has asked followers to pick up machetes and attack me. This person began a narrative that I had sabotaged their career, a narrative that has been picked up or repeated by others. The normal response would be to ignore it all because this person is seeking attention and publicity to benefit themselves. Claiming that I have sabotaged their career is a lie and this person knows that it is a lie. But if something is repeated often enough in this age in which people do not need proof or verification to run with the story, especially a story that has outrage potential, then it can easily begin to seem true. My addressing this lie will indeed get this person some attention. May they bask in it. Here is the truth. I was very supportive of this writer. 
I didn't have to be. I wasn't asked to be. I supported this writer because I believe we need a diverse range of African stories. Sabotaging a young writer's career is just not my style. Style. I would get no benefit or satisfaction from it. Asking that my name be removed from your biography is not sabotaging your career. It is about protecting my boundaries of what I consider acceptable in civil human behavior. You publicly call me a murderer and still feel entitled to benefit from my name. You use my name without my permission to sell your book and then throw an ugly tantrum when someone makes a reference to it. What kind of monstrous entitlement, what kind of perverse self-absorption, what utter lack of self-awareness, what unheeding heartlessness, what frightening immaturity makes a person act this way? Besides, a person who genuinely believes me to be a murderer cannot possibly want my name on their book cover unless, of course, that person is a rank opportunist. And certain young people today, like these two people from my writing workshop, I notice what I find increasingly troubling, a cold-blooded grasping, a hunger to take and take and take, but never give a massive sense of entitlement and inability to show gratitude and ease with dishonesty and pretension and selfishness that is couched in the language of self-care and the expectation always to be helped and rewarded no matter whether deserving or not language that is slick and sleek but with a little emotional intelligence an astonishing level of self-absorption an unrealistic expectation of puritanism from others an overinflated sense of ability or of talent where there is any at all an inability to apologize truly and fully without justifications, a passionate performance of virtue that is well executed in the public space of Twitter, but not in the intimate space of friendship. I find it obscene. There are many social media savvy people who are choking on sanctimony and lacking in compassion, who can fluidly pontificate on Twitter about kindness, but are unable to actually show kindness. People whose social media lives are case studies and emotional aridity. People for whom friendship and its expectations of loyalty and compassion and support no longer matter. People who claim to love literature, the messy stories of our humanity, but are also monomania monomaniacally obsessed with whatever is the prevailing ideological orthodoxy. People who demand that you denounce your friends for flimsy reasons in order to remain a member of the chosen Puritan class. People who ask you to educate yourself while not having actually read any books themselves, while not being able to intelligently defend their own ideological positions because by educate what they actually mean, parrot what I say, flatten all nuance, wish away complexity. People who do not recognize that what they call sophisticated take is really a simplistic mix of abstraction and orthodoxy. Sophistication in this case being a showing off of how all thought they are on the current version of ideological orthodoxy. People who wield the world's violence and weaponize like tarnished pick like tarnished pitchforks, people who depend on obfuscation, who have no compassion for anybody genuinely curious or confused. Ask them a question and you are told that the answer is to repeat a mantra. Ask again for clarity and be accused of violence. How ironic, speaking of violence, that is one of the two who encouraged, how ironic, speaking of violence, that it is one of these two who encouraged Twitter followers to pick up machetes and attack me. And so we have a generation of young people on social media so terrified of having the wrong opinions that they have robbed themselves of the opportunity to think and to learn and to grow. I've spoken to young people who tell me they are terrified to tweet anything that they read and reread their tweets because they fear they will be attacked by their own. The assumption of good faith is dead. What matters is not goodness, but the appearance of goodness. We are no longer human beings. We are now angels jostling to out angel one another. God help us, it is obscene. And so people figure out it was a Kweke Amezi, one of the people that uh, she was referring to because of these tweets from May 1st, 2021, Kweke said, I've been given a heads up that a DJ has recently stated in a public interview that she's planning to write a call out letter to address lies about her. From other statements in her interview, it's fair to assume that retaliation for this thread is a possibility. There's been so much transphobia directed at me since I disclosed in 2018 and I'm not in the mood for the wave of bigoted violence, a prominent cis het figure like her can incite, especially from other Nigerians, so I'm not going to subject myself to that. I trust that there are other people who will pick up machetes to protect us from the harm transphobes like Adichie and Rolling Sea to perpetuate. I, however, will be in my garden with butterflies trying to figure out how to befriend the neighborhood cows. Find me on the gram. So with the reference to machetes, everyone's like, oh, I think this is one of the people that a DJ was referring to. I don't think anyone, or at least I haven't seen anyone figure out who the other person was, but there was that. So it just seems to be a continuation in that ongoing saga. So something that I'm gonna say, and I don't want people, I want you to listen to me before you just like hear what I say and take it and run with it, is that 
I haven't read anything by Chimamanda, but this is a really well-written essay and I hate, <laughs> I hate saying that. And also I think some of these points are very valid in the general context of social media, not against, not in support of her being transphobic. In the general context of social media, especially Twitter, the part like people who are terrified to retweet anything, being attacked, people who demand that you denounce your friends for flimsy reasons in order to remain a member of the chosen Puritan class, what matters is not goodness, but the appearance of goodness. We are no longer human beings. We are now angels jostling to out angel each other or the assumption of good faith is dead. And so I just think of that in the context of Twitter because, and not when we we're, when it comes to, you know, harmful takes, racist, homophobic, things like that, but other things that may be wrong, may be mistakes, may be something maybe someone shouldn't have said, but like she said, the assumption of good faith is dead. And it's automatically that this person set out to be harmful in, in many reasons. And it can apply to so many things that I've covered in these T videos. And then people are so quick to attack them. And then it's like, if you do this, if you follow this person, if you read this book, if I see a picture of this, you're automatically a bad person. I don't like you, you better unfollow this person. It is very much relevant in that case. And so I think this is just in the broader context of how social media is. I do think that people are scared to have varying opinions. And again, not opinions that are differences on human rights, just varying opinions on different things where there is more nuance needed in the conversation. It's easier to just say, all of these people are saying this, I'm just gonna go with this opinion than to say, hey, I might have a different perspective. And it's hard, especially on social media apps like Twitter to even have a conversation like that because if you do say something different, it's easy for that to be screenshot or quote tweeted, retweeted or whatever and be like, look at this, look at this really bad take. It's always assume the worst and then shout about it so other people can gang up on them instead of saying, hmm, like think about it ask the person what they were saying or what they meant, have a conversation. And like I said, again, it's hard to do that on Twitter. It's just automatically you are set out to be a bad person and let's attack you today. So I'm really sad that this essay had to be so well written from her and have really great points. Um, but it is what it is. I'll have a link to it down below if you want to read the full thing and it has the emails there as well. So that is the controversy. So I don't know how to interpret that message as other than transphobic. If you're saying trans women are trans women, they're not women. It's a really, it's a lot. It's comp, it's a lot. I don't know. I'm not the, I'm not well-spoken, well-versed on this, but I know that that was going around recently about those two authors. And so that is, the newest edition and that ongoing feud if you will and i will have um any threads or the article linked down below per usual as well as links to things going on around the world so you can learn a little bit and then research from there links to my social media ways to support my channel also a little bit of information about my nonfiction book club that's starting in july book commuter read we are reading conflict is not abuse by sarah shulman if you want to join you essentially i made a twitter i am making a discord it is coming um i'm uh waiting i'm getting a little bit of art commissioned as a logo so the discord is coming and so i will make sure i share all that information of different places you can keep up with discussions and then we will um figure out a time for a live show in august so you have all of july to read the book um probably have some ongoing discussions and chat in the discord and i will be posting on my instagram on youtube i'll be posting everywhere that i have social media when the live show is and it's obviously not going to work for everyone because of time zones but hopefully a lot of you can join the live show or watch the replay and then the book club is also every other month so we're reading that book in july we'll figure out what book is next in august but that next book won't be for October. So if you're interested in that, it's nonfiction books only. Uh, you're welcome to join, follow the Twitter, and I'll keep you updated everywhere, wherever I can. But thank you so much for watching this video. I love y'all so much. I just want you to know that. I really appreciate you all.
I'm very much a troll in real life and I pretty much stay in my house. So I love all the interactions I can have with all my online friends. Y'all are the best, I'm sorry. I took Nigel back downstairs. Um, when I switched out my phone for my camera, I stay blessed, hydrated, and moisturized and sunscreened. And uh, I'll see you in my next one. Okay, bye.